Right, and I think we shall start. And uh, thanks everybody for coming to this uh, specialist discussion meeting. And we've got a couple of people online as well. And uh, thanks a lot of for our contributor speakers. Uh, a lot of you, I know you travel all the way to UK and in this really bad weather. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just on general information, so we do have a Slack channel that's because today we have a tight schedule and if any questions we can't answer on site, that's please just do ask them on the Slack channel. And uh, to find the Slack channel, we have a GitHub page. You can find that GitHub page on the RIS event website. So on our event website, there should be a link for the GitHub page. And there you also will see the schedule for today's meeting. And for the speakers, you can roughly see where the bouts you are going on soon. Uh, also, today won't be, there won't be a lunch provided by the RS, but there are many, many cafes nearby. So just feel free to grab some food and come back to the fellow room to eat and chat with people. And uh, I will have a time warning for the speakers. Uh, so each, Basically, it's like based on the, your talk length, it will be five minutes, three minutes, two minutes, and it will be the time you should wrap up for some questions being asked. And if that's all right. Um, anything else? Yeah. So we will prioritize the questions on site. And if you are joining us online, please just uh, try to ask questions on the Slack channel because we do have limited time. and. Uh, Okay, I think that would be it for the general information. Uh, so first talk we have would be from, hello, can you change first talk, please? <laughs> yeah, so the first talk we have, we are very happy to invite uh, Yan Xianting, and he's all the way just like, I get, you travel from the US, right? But yeah, he flew from all the way from Australia. <laughs> and Yang Shen is a, quite an expert on machine learning application and also spectroscopy data. So if you have any questions, feel free to chat with him afterwards. And that well, means we can stay. Thank you. Let me try moving forward. Okay, good. Okay, can people hear me online? I really want to. Good. Okay, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, so as you know, I flew from Australia, so I have like via jet lags <laughs> so hopefully i can let's survive to talk today uh it's good to be here it's always uh i think like this is the second time i'm in this like historical building so just give me chill um i was asked to talk about like stellar spectra and also like curve of star which i uh, what i will be like focusing on today so i want to talk about why do we need deep learning for them uh, what are the opportunity some of the caveat and challenges that i think like uh that i thought would that will be like important to discuss. So of course, we are here to talk about the like, one D data. So I do not need to explain to you that uh, you know the spectrum. Of course, is very interesting. In, instead of like looking at individual object, now we have like a plethora of like the survey they are doing, like multi object uh, spectrograph that allow us to collect many many spectra at the same time. I think the internet is a bit slow, so the video is a bit slow, but it's okay. Right, so we are collecting like a lot of spectra at the same time. Also, like, at the same time, because of tests and Kepler's, we are like collecting like many, many uh, a light curve, like ten, tens of uh, thousands of a uh, light curve. So I want to start by saying that, like, uh, despite the light curve and spectra are something that we deal with uh, in daily life uh, as an uh, astronomer, like if you think about this, these are actually very uh, complex uh, uh, object. And the complexity like really come from the di the dimensionality of the observation, right? So if you think about a time series have n time steps, and you know a spectra can have like n pixel, and this like number is typically tens of how thousands of dimension, right? So a spectra could have tens of uh, a thousand of uh, of pixel. <laughs> so but despite the fact that we are talking about one D like data. <laughs> Um, uh, in terms of the, di the dimensionality, it's actually not uh, any like simpler than all the things that we love in computer like vision, including like the image net, right? So think about like the image net, sorry, uh, have like 128 times 128 pixels, so that will be 10,000 uh, pixels. So spectra also like, typically have tens of a thousand of pixels. 
So like, despite it's 1D, one should not think that 1D is uh, easier than 2D. In fact, uh, one, I, I will like, argue that the 1D is actually more like challenging and the challenges are come from the fact that we actually like, in many cases, we do not know what is the right like, symmetry of the data. <laughs> so, so let's talk about why do we need to do deep learning? Like to understand this part, I think like we, let's start by talking about how people have been overcoming this uh, huge like a uh, dimensionality classically. So what is the limitation and why deep learning is important? So it comes down to, we want to understand the physics that, that engender the observation and the observation live in tens of th uh, thousands of dimension because it's very uh, like high dimension. In many cases, we cannot write down the likelihood so the classical law is that if you cannot like write down the likelihood, the second best thing to do is to find a low dimensional like, embedding that uh, characterizes the observation. And classically, the way that we have been thinking about the summary like, statistic of the observation quite often come from like theory or human like, heuristic, right? So take the example of the light curve. The light curve like, itself could be a vector of tens of uh, thousands of uh, a dimension, but we know that this uh, stochastic field is mostly uh, generated by uh, stellar uh, oscillation. And we also know that for different star, <coughs> we have a uh, typical uh, frequency for a different star. So meaning that even though the light curve lives in tens of thousands of dimension in the frequency space, most of the information is like, characterized by the uh, the, the characteristic like frequency, uh, which is what we call like new max, right? So you compress the information from tens of uh, thousands of dimension to one scalar that uh, we can write down the likelihood quite well. So this is good, but of course, the problem with this type of uh, summary like statistic is that you're losing out some of the information. So for example, if you use like new, like is that a question? No, <laughs> just, just scratching. Um, so please ask that question anytime. It's meant to be the discussion, of course. Um, so for example, if you just are focused on a new max, you, you are not using the information from the granulation, right? So the, the, the granulation information is embedded in the light curve, but they are at the different frequency. So if you use a, a summary like statistic like new max, you are losing out the information from the granulation, which of course should tell you something um, about the labels of the star. So like, this is the problem with light curve, but uh, similarly in spectra, we have the same like, problem. So the spectra can live in like a very high dimensional space in like classically, what we love to do is to look at the spectra like spectra uh, indices, which is your like beloved like equivalent width. So you have some lines that you trust and then you calculate the equivalent width. So you compress the tens of uh, a thousand of uh, a dimension into a few tens of numbers which is also fine, but you're losing out quite a lot of uh, information there as well. So understand what you're losing out. So here I'm plotting one of the typical spectrum, but uh, on the y-axis here is the response of the spectrum with respect to the abundances. So here's D spectrum, D abundances, meaning that as I change, say the magnesium um, abundances, how the spectrum change. So as I change the, the magnesium, uh, abundances the first thing is that of course the line change right so the magnesium the atomic light transition that is due to the magnesium will change so we change the depth of the line but the spectra change more than just the magnesium line so for example here what happening is that as you change the magnesium you are changing the stellar uh, atmospheric structure so you're changing the whole spectrum meaning that even for a pixel they are not explicitly from the atomic tra transition from magnesium. The pixel itself will also change as you modify like magnesium. Of course, those pixels also contain the information um, about like magnesium. And therefore, if you're using the spectral like, indices, you're losing out like, some of this like, subtle like, information. In fact, this information can be quite like, pronounced. So like, this is a work, quite old work from my like, PhD work. So we are looking at low resolution spectra and we and we show that if you are like if you can use the information from the whole spectrum from all pixels like even at low resolution there's still um a loss of uh, information of, about the abundances 
So classically at low resolution, the people thought uh, that you can only get the stellar parameters, but turns out that like you can get many more abundances provided that you can go beyond just a few like indices, <laughs> right? Sorry, not, not been the best today, not sure why. So to recap, right? So the classical way of thinking about this question is using the lower uh, dimensional embedding, but in many cases, it do not contain all the information. So like, ideally what you want to do is to say, like, can we get rid of the embedding, right? So we just do the regression at the raw space. So, and this is where like the first like, application of deep learning to 1D data, because here you're dealing with a high, high dimensional like, regression like, problems. And this is the case where deep learning can play a big role. So I think like <clears throat> some people have like, sometimes have like misconception like, like about deep learning. So what is the big deal about deep learning, right? So the one of the characteristic of deep learning compared to the classical like uh, a machine learning is that it's able to evade the curse of a, di a, a dimensionality. So what do I mean by that, right? So think about simple like regression like problems. So if I have a 1D problem, I might need two points. In 2D, I might need four points. In 3D, I might need like eight points and so forth. So in the classical regression uh, the regime, you're always cursed by the dimension, meaning that as the dimension like, increases, the number of uh, data that I need to solve the regression like, problem should also go exponentially. <clears throat> but so this is why people thought, you know, like regression in high high dimensional space is quite like hopeless. So you want to find a features of lower uh, di uh, a dimension. But what deep learning has taught us is that like, like this is not something that is uh, unsolvable. So even you have a very like a jagged space in a very high dimensional space, you can still have a few data points, you drop the blanket and the blanket do describe the landscape like extremely well. Uh, so this is good and bad in the in, in two ways. Good thing is that maybe like we can do the regression in the raw space. But the bad thing is that like this seems not bad thing. So uh, the mysterious thing is that like this seems too good to be true. Um, so for many people, like, this seems like some alchemy, right? How deep learning can describe this like, regression in the very high high dimensional space. But over time, we we do know that this is not some alchemy. <laughs> so what happened is that all the successful deep learning architecture fundamentally are making some like some assumption on the symmetry of the data or what we call the inductive like uh, biases in deep learning right so or the simple way to think about this is the following so let's say i have a 3d sphere uh, like you might think that in order to sample the sphere i need many many like data points but if i know that the sphere is a sphere then I can collapse all the data into 1D and just like, describe the radial like, dimension, right? So this is exactly what deep learning is doing because all the architecture is making some assumption um, about the data. So you are implicitly like pro projecting the data into a lower like, dimensional like, manifold like, before you do the regression. And this is particularly like, like important to, to make sure we understand because I think like, like this is one of the biggest like danger pitfall and uh, challenges of 1D data because quite often I see people do the following. <clears throat> so you just think like all things are, it's a nail and just like have, ju just use the hammer, right? So, so let's say like you have a screw, you think that your, your classical ham like hammer like do not work. So you go for a tall hammer, but also like does not solve the problem because what you need is a screwdriver, right? So, so, so I want to give you a specific like example. <clears throat> so think about a light curve. So like, again, we have long known that the light curve should contain uh, information um, of, about the star, <coughs> including the surface of gravity and the stellar interior. And if you just use the summary like statistic like new max, then you will lose some of the information. So since deep learning become uh, popular, so, so many people have tried to use like, CNN to apply that to light curve. And they have also some like, successes, but one can imagine like CNN is not the right like inductive like uh, biases for the data. And this is quite uh, easy to understand. So one of the limitations of CNN is that it has a very local like, perceptive field, meaning that 
each time you do the convolution, you're only looking at pixel that are uh, adjacent to one pixel. Meaning that if I have two points that are like really far apart, like we'll take a very deep like network until the two points can see like each other. But for light curve, the important thing is not about the adjacent pixel, but rather the long range like information. Because for stellar like oscillation, what you care about is the information between the peaks, right? So this is why it's, it's quite uh, easy to understand why a transformer like um like model should work like better because uh, a transformer uh use the long range of information. So for people who don't know what is the transformer, uh, this is basically your chat uh, like GPT, right? So all the natural language uh, like processing models are based on the transformer, which is based on the idea of like attention. So the idea of the attention here is that for any uh, like sentences. The information like often like do not come from the adjacent words, but rather words that are far apart. So for example, these sentences, the important word is cat, legs, and paws, right? So, so, so this will uh, uh, characterize uh, the sentence. So with a student, we apply that to light curve. So using the transformer like models, we believe this is also the first application of a transformer to light curve. So I'll be looking at the capital uh, light curve and the background here show you the attention learned by the model. So you can see that like, the attention is indeed highlighting the information between peaks, but even within peaks, they are strong attention. They are capturing some of the non-Gaussian like, information. So these are just like high, high level why this might work, but it have also like real life con uh, consequences. So on the right hand side here, show when you use some blind machine learning tall, tall hammer to, to hammer your light curve, it's okay, it's really okay, right? But uh, like you try to get the log G of star, the, the, the surface of uh, gravity of star, it's not the, the best tool, but you can use a very small uh, like transformer. It works much like better than your CNN or your K-means and so forth. So the important point here is that for any 1D data, it's very important to understand the inductive biases. And I think like one of the blind spot is people love to apply to CNN, uh, CNN to everything, but in one D data, CNN is ne uh, like never a good choice, right? So, uh, so, so this is the light curve. Let's talk about spectra. So we talk about spectra have quite a lot of information provided that you can extract the information from the whole spectrum. Uh, so this is the theory. Uh, we also uh, apply that to real data and show that indeed, even at low resolution, you can get the abundances from, from a low resolution spectra. But uh, this is the point that I want to make again you know, and again, because in spectra, people also love to apply like CNN, but CNN is of course not the good architecture because the inductive biases of CNN, like focusing on two things. One is the distortion is stable. So meaning that if you distort a cat, it's still a cat. It's a, like a, a translational like invariant. So if you shift a cat, it's still a cat. But none of these are inductive biases apply to spectra. So it's, it's very, uh, easy to show that in most of the application, a CNN would not work like a better than a fully a co a, a connected a network. In fact, a better like, like models that my group has been exploring is uh, following the idea of the light curve. So you're using a uh, transformer to capture the information because spectra itself also contain long range like, information, right? So if you have two pixels, they are long, far apart, uh, they might both like due to like magnesium, right? So you have also long range uh, uh, information in spectrum. So, uh, so this is that. So this is the simple case of applying deep learning to the 1D data. So you treat this as a regression like problems, but even a simple like regression problem do, a lot, do uh, require us to think deeply about the symmetry of the data. Let's talk about like something more advanced, right? So like beside the supervised like regression problem, the other big class of thing that you could do is the unsupervised uh, uh, learning, right? So you're learning the distribution of the object. Um, so quite lots of work that I've been doing with my groups now is focusing on understanding how you describe the distribution of light curve and spectra. Uh, and quite lots of tools that we use are the uh, gen generative like, models. So you might ask what is the uh, gen generative uh, model? So ChatGPT is a, gen a, a generative like, models. So what it does is like even a human prompt, 
you try to generate the responses that will satisfy the prompts. Uh, so this is uh, from Dao E2, from OpenAI. So this is cute, like kangaroos and telescope. Uh, and you might think, well, this is cute, but what does that have to do with spectra, right? Oh, yeah, so, 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 so that is a theorist because you look into telescope in the wrong way. Uh, so, so, so I wonder, like, like, this is cute, but what does that have to do with like 1D like data? But to understand this point, what is to understand that all the ge generative models fundamentally is learning the distribution of the training like data, right? So in DAO E2, you have some Instagram like, images and text, and your goal is to describe the distribution in this space. The only challenge is that like, both the X and Y axis is like millions of light dimension. But luckily, of course, deep learning seems to be like, doing quite a good job in capturing the distribution. Or uh, when you have learned the distribution, then to, to reply to prompt is just saying, like, given access, I want to read out all the possible whys, which is why like, chat, like GPT technically is not plagiarism because you are never repeating things. You are just sampling from the distribution. Right? But importantly, what I want to uh, mention is that this type of models ultimately is like, describing a conditional like, distribution just that this like, distribution is in a very high dimensional space. And like, understand this point, one need to, then one can understand there are lots of things like, like you can do with the 1D like data, right? So for example, you can like, describe the distribution of spectra conditioning on the stellar like, parameters. And you might ask, why, why would you want to do that? Uh, so one like, reason is because the spectra itself, of course, depends on the stellar like parameters, right? So uh, F dwarf and a G dwarf are not the same, but if you can conditioning out the, the uh, nuisance like parameters, then the correlation between the pixel are entirely due to the atomic tra uh, transition. So if you can condition out the stellar like parameters and looking at the co correlation sample by the distribution, then you can start to understand which pixel are co correlated with which, which, uh, uh, which pixel, which allow you to look at which pixels are due to the same um, elements. So in this paper that we wrote uh, last year at the ICML, like as a spotlight talk, we show that you can actually learn the atomic tra uh, transition just empirically from the spectra by understanding which pixel are co correlating with which, uh, which pixel. Uh, this is, of course, a simpler plot. The network itself costs like a billion like, parameters and uh, 16 like, GPU to train for four days. Uh, but so, so, so this is the part I want to mention. You know, this type of like, idea is, is very cute, but it takes a long time like, uh, until this is uh, possible. So think about a few years like, ago when GANs is still like, quite, quite popular. It's very hard to use GAN to do science because GAN has this problem of what we call mode collapse, right? So we are not capturing the entire, like, like the entire like, distribution, but we are capturing part of the distribution. <clears throat> but what has changed in the last few years is that there are lots of like models that seem to be more uh, resilient to mode collapse, like the normalizing flow or diffusion like models. Uh, of course, I will not get into the technical uh, like, details here, but, but the important point here is that like, in the last two years, we started to be able to capture the entire like, distribution, even in the very high dimensional space. And this is why we can do the co correlation of, of pixel that I just showed. But beside that, being able to capture the whole distribution um, also open up quite a lot of like, application. So the one thing you could do is to find like, outliers, right? So once you have captured things as a distribution, then you can ask if something is normal inside the distribution, or some unicorn like flying like, like outside the distribution or in the raw space, like in the spectral space. So like in the same paper, what we have shown with uh, Joe is showing the following. So you, you can uh, summarize all the normal spectra as a distribution. This gives you the normal likelihood. And then we inject some weird spectra. So like the poor star and carbon like enhanced star and faster rotator, you can, uh, immediately flag them out, even without doing the analysis on the spectra. So all living in the spectra space, you can find outliers. Of course, like, you would not know what those uh, outliers are, but this gives you a very automated way to look at which spectra that like, you should like, follow up without doing the analysis. 
because we have the ability to summarize the distribution uh, like uh, uh, directly in the raw space. So this uh, one application and the other thing that is quite cute is a uh, deep fake, right? So, so what is deep fake? So, so basically in many cases you have two distribution, right? So you have the synthetic spectra and the observed spectra. They are similar, but they are not like exactly the same. It's like you have, you can only make uh, courses in your computer, but you need to fit a zebra. So what do you do? <clears throat> so the best way to understand the like, deep fake is that you have two distribution. They are quite like similar, but they are offset, right? So, and once you can like, describe the distribution of both space, of course, the, like you can ask what is the minimal path that make the two like distribution match like each other. So of course, like, like you can ask that like, this is interpretable like, or not, but the important point is that like, this is not statistically sound. So if you have two distribution, that is a minimal path that morph one to the other. And this is how you do deep fake. What does that have to do with spectra? Then you can use this to auto correct for the imperfectness of the spectra. So here I'm showing you the, one of the typical, the top panel show you, uh, the white line show you the typical, uh, the observed spectrum. The red line show you the classical like, models. Uh, it's, it's, it's okay, but not great because you have a loss of like, like missing like physics. But once you can describe the distribution, you can morph the two like distribution. So this leads to the bottom panel, which show you that you can auto correct for the distribution of spectra based entirely on the spectra, right? So this become a way to close the synthetic gap like between two domain. Um, I must apologize that I am not in the best self today. So hopefully this is still like, understandable. Uh, so just want to, to summarize. So, so uh, first of all, the 1D data is actually like as complex as the 2D data, just from the uh, dimension and point of view. I also hope to convince you that it is even more complex because in many cases, we do not know what is the correct like inductive like biases because we have little guidance from the industrial world because like quite, quite lots of things that they care about are developing a network with the inductive like biases that do not like apply to the 1D like data. So the CNI is one great like, example. But nonetheless, the, the whole framework of deep, deep learning, the key point here is that we are able to deal with the dimension. So we can get rid of the summary like statistic. We talk about why this is important because many information are extremely subtle. If you use the summary like statistic, you lose the information. Um, we talk about, you know, even for the simple like regression, it's important to understand the inductive like biases. There are very few like, like cases like CNN is a good, uh, good, good application for 1D like data. It meant, in almost all cases in 1D data, uh, transformer or even a fully like like connected uh, network is most most likely to be like better. Uh, but beyond the regression problem, we talk about more fancy approaches about the dis learning the distribution of spectra, and that leads to a lot of little interesting application like finding outliers, looking at the co correlation of pixel, and also like uh, more uh, morphing one distribution to the other and correct for the synthetic uh, gap. So with this, I will stop and take questions. Any questions here? Yeah? And I will start then. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question that uh, you mentioned about, for example, uh, try to map the whole distribution, then you can be able to identify outlier. Yeah. But I'm wondering, can you comment on what is the normal distribution in the astronomical context? Because, for example, we are now having a new uh, survey. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then you're seeing more and more new right. things right. in that. And are they going to be all identified as outlier in that case? Right. So I think what you would do is like doing some clipping. So, so even though you are mapping the entire like, distribution, by definition, it will also include the outlier because it's in your training data. But those things will still have a low likelihood because they are at the tail of the distribution. Right. So it's really about asking within, even your outlier is within your sample, those things are at the outskirts of the distribution because they are dwarfed by the many, many like, normal example. So, so in this case, we actually do train with some of the outliers, but so you can still flag them out because they do have a low likelihood. Right, no yeah. problem. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay.
Yeah, thanks, Yosen. That's very inspiring, amazing talk. Um, so that the final two uh, topics in the spectra. So that when you, yeah, it's like detecting outliers, et cetera. So you are using a physical model to uh, map out training. And also oh, the okay. final topics, and you said you are adjusting like to the real data. Right. And uh, how do you can sort of connect like a physical model to the this kind of real uh, more complicated. You mean the outlier yeah. detection? So the outlier detection is entirely working on just one set of data. Mm. So that we actually mock out some like more RPG spectra and just work in that space. So no labels, just pure spectra and just say, can I like describe the distribution of spectra? But then if it, because Apogee had a uh, selection Right. Uh, already pre-selection in, uh, right. yeah. in a survey. So how you can deal with that? Right. So here, yeah, um, yeah. So like this comeback is quite like related to like study question. Like how do you define normal? What is the training mm -hmm. data that you're doing? Because you are still like describing the distribution of your training like data. So in this case, it's quite controlled because we are just like looking at some distribution of like labels that we know to be true, like like generate more spectra, like noise them out, and you know inject some outlier to see if we can find them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but of course in many cases, you know, if you just train on the upper G main sample, like uh, you might flag the globular like cluster spectra to be outlier, which might or might not be a good idea, right? Yeah, but the point here you can completely get rid of the label and operate in the spectral space and that is good in many ways because they get rid of the models like completely okay yeah. yeah thank you very much that thanks uh yanshan again yeah. can we have our next speaker apart nayak please Um, so first of all, thanks to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to talk about my work here today in this meeting. Um, hello everyone, I'm Barth Nack. I'm a second year PhD student at the LMU Munich in Germany. And with my collaborators listed here, I've been working on, well, the fonts are all messed up, I see. Um, I've been working on developing an inference tool based on deep learning from Lyman Alpha Forests in Astrophysics and Cosmology that I call LIANA here, which stands for Lyman Alpha Neural Network Analysis. Um, we have already seen a lot um, of this from Yuan Sin's talk that we have uh, so, some data or like we do an experiment or observe astronomically and we collect some data and we have some model for that, which has a parameter set high vector here, and we're interested in constraining the parameter values. Um, right, um, so we're interested mathematically speaking in this quantity called the posterior, and the base theorem that we have already seen here tells you that it's a product of a likelihood and your prior knowledge on the parameters. Um, but then, because the data is most of the time a st stochastic draw from a distribution, you cannot directly compare that with the model. So you have to resort to some summary statistics as we already saw. Um, and then you can write a likelihood function where you can compare the, the summaries from a data in the model. But um, as we already um, saw that this leads uh, to loss of information and hence loss of constraining power. And we want to recover that. So the, the question then we ask is that can we um, use this full data set for, for inference than just the summaries? And if we can somehow manage that, then um, is this more constraining? And we use deep learning for, for, for addressing that problem because this is really efficient at finding parameter values from large data sets. That's what we have at hand. 
Um, the particular problem that I'm trying to address in this work is one in intergalactic medium astrophysics that are the temperature and density relationship. So here you see um, a slice through one of our simulation boxes that of the, the density of the gas in the, in the universe at, at large scales, the, the intergalactic gas. And this is the temperature of the same slice of through the simulation of, of the same gas. And when I toggle um, between the two, well, I can't seem to be able to do that. But what you see is that the, where the gas is dense, it's also hot and vice versa. Yeah. So there is a systematic relationship between the density and the temperature of the gas that if you look at the two dimensional histogram, you see that most of the gas is falling in this red, very narrow red region, which can be modeled with this uh, power law relationship and the temperature and the density, which has two parameters, T naught and gamma, the temperature at the mean density of the gas and a power law index. But in real world, we don't have direct access to the temperatures and the density of the gas. So we resort to using a proxy that is the Lyman alpha forest. So we have some quasar at very high redshift that emits a continuum of radiation um, and which has this um, peak at the Lyman alpha wavelength at the emission at the Lyman alpha by the quasar. And when this travels through expanding um, space, um, the video is not playing. Um, let's see. Um, anyway, so when, when, when this radiation travels through expanding space, it redshifts. Um, and at the same time that it encounters pockets of gas, which contains hydrogen, it's getting absorbed at the at the wavelength of Lyman alpha. So um, because this is happening through expanding universe, what you end up seeing is a a bunch of or a forest of Lyman alpha absorption wavelengths, um, absorption lines in the blue word of, of the Lyman alpha peak, which is right there. So this whole absorption um, feature is, is the Lyman alpha forest in these quasars. And, and in a way, this is tracing the gas um, between the, the quasar and us. Um, the, 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 the depth of the line will tell you the density of the gas. It's it, depending on the, on the density, there will be more or less absorption and the width of individual lines will tell you how hot the gas is due to the thermal broadening of the line. So this is a way to indirectly map um, the gas density and temperature in the intergalactic medium. And um, let me go back and just briefly mention that we are interested in the overall absorption on top of the continuum. So we um, divide out the continuum and we look at this uh, dimensionless flux we call in line alpha analyses. Um, the, in our simulations, then we can pick random lines of sight like that and say that at one end we have a quasar and the other end we're observing it. And by running some uh, pipeline for, for post-processing, we can find mock Lyman alpha absorption profiles that, that look something like that, the, the flux again. Now here you might notice that this is stochastic. The, 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 the location in the spectrum of where the, uh, a particular Lyman alpha absorption line falls is not fixed. It can vary depending on where the gas is dense on, on the line of sight. So this is stochastic and it, it does not have a wavelength specific dependence in the, in the, in the, in the spectrum. Um, so there, there are no large scale um, correlations here. What I mean to say is that this line over here does not necessarily affect um, something over there. 
the way to do inference from Lyman alpha forest again um, is through summary statistics. And one of the most common is the 1D flux bar spectrum. So from a given data set, a mean flux value, you can define a flux contrast in this fashion and then take a Fourier transform of that along the line of sight. So that is what 1D is in the name. And then up to some prefactor, you can define the second order moment of that distribution of, of that um, Fourier mode as the 1D power spectrum. This is what a typical 1D power spectrum looks like. On the right, you, what you see is the, the PDF of the flux, the histogram of the flux, and you notice that it's highly non-Gaussian. So it's not sufficient to just characterize it with, um, I'm sorry, what's happening here? Seems to be. Um, so it, it's, it's not sufficient to just restrict ourselves to using the second order moments. There's much more information that is contained in all the higher order terms. And we would like to recover all those um, higher order terms to, for, for inference. So we propose to do that with a 1D CNN. And in this case, a CNN does work because it is, as I said, it is stochastic and it does not depend on, uh, it. there are correlations on the smaller scales, individual lines, but not on the large scales so much. So our CNN then extracts features over five convolutional layers from the spectra. And then that gets fed into a fully connected deep neural network with two latent layers to do inference of the two parameters. And, and uh, also we are interested in a posterior distribution. So we would like to estimate some uncertainty that is a covariance matrix, two cross two symmetric at the two parameters. So we have two plus three um, neurons at the output layer. And we use Kara TensorFlow to uh, implement these models using NVIDIA 40 GPUs that we have at our disposal in the LMU computing clusters. We train this by minimizing a particular type of loss function called a negative log likelihood loss function. So for point predictions of the, of the parameter values, um, this is what an expression of the loss looks like. And over here, this is this the usual mean squared error term? But on top of that, we also have a covariance estimate now. So um, some general uh, details of our network. We use nonlinear activation in terms of the leaky version of the ReLU. Our weights are initialized with this normal way and they are regularized by a weight decay. Um, use Atom Optimizer with a learning rate schedule for training. That looks like this is a stepwise exponential decay, the steps of 10 epochs. And our, this is our then learning curve. Um, and what you see, what we see is that about epoch 180, it stops um, improving the validation loss. And hence, after that point, the network is overfitting to the training set. So what we do at the end is we reset our network to its state at about this epoch and use that for our inference purposes. Um, but first of all, let's look at our posterior distribution that we get from doing a likelihood analysis from the PAR spectra by doing some sort of uh, MCMC sampling. And this is, our, this is what our contour looks like. And when we use our CNN, Sansa, um, it looks like this. So indeed what we see is that we have way more constraining power at the, at the level of spectra rather than at the power spectra. So by um, doing a power spectrum analysis, we were losing a lot of constraining power that we can gain at the spectrum level. So far, these contours that we see here is a result of a very um, cursory hyperparameter optimization using a random search, but we are in the process of some very rigorous Bayesian hyperparameter optimization. I'm sorry, this is a little too, is this, um, I think from, yeah, um, I'm at the last slide. 
This is just the result of you know um, converting from Keynote to PowerPoint, and I didn't know which way to do that best. So um, yeah, so right now in the process of doing some Bayesian hyperparameter optimization to land at the best possible location on the bias variance trade-off. And uh, so far, we haven't taken into account any realistic noise or systematic effects in the spectra. So in the future, we would also like to implement that. And uh, we would also like to infer some cosmological parameters of interest with the same inference framework. Um, so then in the spirit of not summarizing, I'd stop here and see if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry for the technical issue. I think that's because think of... Yeah, I think it's timed in a way. So yeah. it always changes automatically. Is it possible to turn off the PPT automatic changes slide things? Yeah, I think after a while, that will change the same. Yeah. Anyway, any questions on Same. site? Yeah, I love your works. I'm uh, sorry that like, like in some cases, CNN is like right too. <laughs> just, yeah, just try to be like, like provocative. I'm just curious about the co covariances uh, metrics that you optimize for, since you're dealing with a stochastic process. So then, um, Shouldn't the co covariance like metrics be completely uncorrelated uncor because you are dealing with stochastic process? And well, yeah. yeah, so I mean, we have two parameters in our model, and there could be correlations at the at the level of spectra. So, so in the two dimensional, if you if you look at this, um, if you look at this curve, there there seems to be an axis along which the the contours are. Oh, so you elongated. Learn, so you learn so, the covariances of the parameters with the parameters, yes, and much as so not in the flux space. Yeah, not in flux. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, because of time, and we will move on to the next sure. quick uh, next speakers. Uh, let's welcome Alicia. Slide, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for letting me be here and try to tell you the effort that we are doing in Milano Bicocca. I'm Alessia Longobardi, a researcher um, at Milan, and uh, we are studying the way to make the most automatic the study of the circumgalactic medium, the CGM, and how we do it by studying the uh, spectra of high redshift quasars. Uh, whose light goes through the CGM, and so it keeps the imprint of the uh, in in the in the absorption line. So the outline of the talk is quite straightforward. I'm going to tell you about what data we are using, and then I'm going to introduce you to uh, tools that we have uh, written to the um, to study uh, and to model um, the absorption lines in the quasar spectra. And then if I have time, I'm also going to show you how we are using 1D CNN um, and how this is actually going um, to give us some nice, nice results. So the data, uh, this is a sample that uh, has been gathered by people in Milano Bicocca. The data are quite nice. They are from medium high resolution quasar spectra. The different surveys are listed there on the left hand side. And so what we have here is a sample of roughly 650, exactly 650 metal absorbers. Um, where the 70% are moderate ions dominated by carbon-4 and silicon-4, and the 30%, the remaining 30% is actually magnesium-2. Um, sorry, they are low um, ions um, dominated by magnesium-2. The um, characteristics are that the systems, so these um, metals, they are tracing systems at redshift from roughly 1 to 4.2, and also systems with column density that are quite low uh, up to very uh, high column density systems. If we then look at the delta V90 distribution, so delta V90 is a concept that I'm going to use a lot in this presentation, is the width of the uh, metal absorber in the velocity space. We see that it peaks at roughly uh, 80 kilometers per second, but then we have to pay attention if we are uh, taking into consideration moderate ions or low ions because the distribution can be different. 
So let me uh, speak about the first tool. This is MCL. Uh, this is the Bayesian code with which we try to get the most accurate information about each void profile that goes to constitute the uh, total uh, velocity profile of an absorber. So you have an example here in the background. And what is the what are the main characteristics? This is a Bayesian fitting code. So it gets the entire statistical description of all the parameters that we are fitting. So this is the B parameter, the, the, the width in the velocity space of the single void component, the column density, and the uh, redshift. It also very um optimized for high dimensional parameter space because it uses a polychart. Um, nested sampling. And so um, in this way, we can get the statistical information we have. So uh, we have the information on how the profile fits the data. So you see the data in black and here in red is the model, each single void component is in blue. It tells us um, the uh, statisticals on the number of components that should be there. So here, for example, in this example, we have three that has higher probability, but there is a non-zero probability that a fourth component is there. And then we can also get the um, marginalized distribution between all the parameters. So the entire statistical information is, uh, is there. And one thing also that I would like to stress is that it's very adaptive. So this code can fit um, in uh, roughly one hour high resolution spectra. We are speaking about the spectrum of roughly um, eight kilometers per second of resolution. Um, in yeah, in one hour, but it can also give us very uh, precise information for low resolution spectra, uh, for example, 60 kilometers per second that are the next surveys like we QSO survey, for example, and so it's uh, it's a very adaptive. Also, it doesn't require so much of human intervention, only the uh, range of the parameters to be to fit has to be given and no um, initial condition. We have done some tests. So this is the uh, absolute relative error matrix. So this is to show that when we have a very uh, ideal spectra, this is with the signal to noise at 500, the systematic behind MCR, they are very uh, small. And so these are the relative errors that we obtained for the B parameter, for the uh, column density, and for the redshift translated in, uh, in velocity here. And uh, what we see is that it's uh, it's very precise. It just gets a little bit difficult when we have very high column density single void components, and there, in fact, the error increases a little bit. But uh, I can tell you that um, thanks to the entire statistical information, we can actually see that there is saturation, and even when there is hidden saturation, MC alpha is um, capable of of showing so. This is just to show that uh, as function of signal to noise, uh, the distribution of the B parameters and column density are well retrieved already at redshift 10. So each of these point is the um, single void component information. And of course, when we go down to a signal to noise of five, here the p-value statistics is not high at all, but this is because we just are not able to associate single input uh, versus retrieved components. So there you have to speak about the total distribution, so the total value, and when we do so, the information is, uh, is quite accurate. Okay, so MCR actually helped us to give us um, infinite noise, uh, sorry, infinite signal to noise information about these, uh, those 650 profile that we uh, gather. And this was because we wanted to create a library that could um, help us to create a synthetic library of meta profiles that then we can, with which we can then simulate millions of, of metals. This is what NMFPM does. So here in the background, you have the real profile, and this in yellow is instead simulated profile. How does NMF work? So NMF um, is just assumes that you can reconstruct a profile, a um, positive signal, as the linear combination of the element of two matrices, X and C, and how do we then simulate, how do we then create synthetic profile? This is just 
uh, randomly sample, sampling the NMF latent features. And this is a quite effective way of creating a synthetic, uh, um, a synthetic library of uh, meta profiles. Problem is the NMF is actually quite sensitive to um, outliers. And so we had to create a algorithm that would give us the best statistical information, sorry, the best statistical constraint to have a physical um, information as output. And so what, what I'm showing you here, this is just the algorithm that I follow, but in particularly, uh, but particularly I would like to show you that uh, we had to um, sample beans of Delta B90. And we did so by um, sampling increasing bin of Delta B90 to see which one was the best. And so here you see color coded by the P value of the um, uh, data simulated. So KS test between the data and simulation and the data and reconstructed. And then by also looking at the residual variance of the data and reconstructed profile, we could then pick the best model, NMF model. So the best number of components that uh, with which we can reduce the space information. This is something that was done for the community. So as I was, I was telling you, this was done thinking about the WAVE survey. And we have put all the information that comes from the uh, X and C matrices. We have made it public. Uh, this is a Python package that uh, um, can create as many absorber you want. Um, you can create it with a moderate, or low delta B90 distribution, but if you want to follow your own delta B90 distribution, you can also use your own. As output, you would have the uh, metal absorbers, you would have wind noise with no noise, uh, you would have the, the wavelengths and the noise array, and so then you can run those tools, like for example, MCALF to retrieve the information. So when you can get this information, this is actually available on the um, uh, GitHub pages of Matteo Fossati, that is the one behind MCALF, and uh, mine, that is that I am the one behind NMFPM. And um, this is soon going to be published on Rusty. So uh, if you're interested, you can have a look. Uh, you can have a look. So I hope I have a few minutes left. Okay. So um, the idea was to create this library of synthetic profile because we want to um, try to understand how we can automatically study all the information that is going to come with DAISY, with the formos, with the with weave. And so what we have done, we have used NMF to create synthetic metals. We have used uh, reliable information about the noise that would come, for example, from a spectrograph like WEAVE, and we have created spectra 1D information like this one. Of course, we have features. This is a carbon-4 that are very nicely. This is a carbon-4 with high column density, but of course, we are uh, targeting uh, systems that are also less, uh, have, are also characterized by lower column density. So, for example, this is magnesium to uh, magnesium to information. Why this can be given and in, uh, fed into a CNN uh, um, network? And this is because we are interested in features that have a special correlation that happens actually quite locally. So this is within 40 kilometers per second, and this is within 80 kilometers per second. And this is always constant in the velocity space. How do we do so though? We don't give, uh, we don't fed the entire spectrum. We don't fed the entire information, but we actually do a sliding window, so 100 pixel. And this one is then uh, fed into the CNN, CNN network. This is just a schematic representation of it, dropout layers are not, yeah. are not given. This is anyway, still work in progress. So um, take it with a pinch of salt, what I say, but, um, what we do here, it's a multitasking CNN classification. So at the end, we will have two output layers, one for classification. Is there carbon-4? Is there magnesium-2? Yes or not? Or is there noise? And localization. So we are interested in uh, finding the middle spot between the, the doublet position. <laughs> And these are the results. This is uh, run on a smaller sample of uh, the 10 to the 6 profile that actually we are producing. 
so this is a confusion matrix on the diagonal here. You have the information about how many Mg2 carbon four and noise have been retrieved as function of the one that has uh, the time input. This is the recovery fraction. We are doing not greatly at lower column density. We hope that the increasing of the sample size is going to uh, improve. And we are not doing so bad about the localization either. Yes. Uh, so, of course, if the feature is really strong, the position is very well uh, uh, found, then, of course, the more the signal is into the noise, the more difficult it is for the CNN to identify it. But in terms of error, this is a 10 to the minus 4 error on the redshift. That is what people in the literature are finding, even, even a little bit better. Again, this is work in progress, not done on the entire sample that we could have. And so if you are interested in staging, and I'll switch here for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions here? Thank you, really interesting. I was wondering how your code handles overlapping doublets, if you have doublets that are close velocity separation. Yeah, the, so for the CNN, you mean? At, at the moment, it's not considering them. So at the moment, we are just uh, we are just considering pure doublets. So if there is only carbon four, only magnesium two. That was actually my question as well. Uh, any questions? Any other questions? Right. Uh, if not, that's thanks, Alicia. Again, can we try Minfen? Are you still online? Can we try you again? Yes, I'm here. Uh, let me share screen. Does it work? Yeah, this time it works. Oh, well, I have I a have nice, nice video, video on the on the side. On the side. Uh, can, uh, you can you turn up the microphone? microphone? Thank you. Cool. So um, yeah. Thanks for having me back um again. So I will talk about this uh, automated um, methods for finding the number of observers DOAs using um, machine learning plus basic models. And uh, so this this idea was initially proposed by Roman Garnett, and we extended it um, to different applications, including um, DOAs, quest registry estimations, and also the common for metal lines find finders. And, and and we partially funded by um, Amazon Machine Learning Award, so we have some computational resources there. Um, the outline of this talk will be I will talk about how we use basic model selection as a kind of classifier, and how we incorporate uh, machine learning in this uh, framework, and what are DOAs, and how's the problem of finding DOAs, and three examples of the applications. And so this is the best rules everybody loves and um, knows pretty well. And the idea is that you have these um, posterior of the models. You try to find the probability of this model that's by considering all the possible alternative models. So this is kind of class of classifier because you're choosing the model out of like um, different options of the models. The machine learning part we will be doing is the part that learning the likelihood function. For explaining the, the oh, explaining the data, um, a spectrum incoming spectrum based on the learned models, and the nice things about best rules is that you can incorporate your prior beliefs on the trained machine learning models. You can do the model selection incorporating the priors. So it's kind of overview, overview of this um, idea of the basic model selection. And what are DOAs? So DOAs basically they are the strong lemma of absorption lines in the forest. So these videos, people, some people have seen before that um, if you have quasi emitting lights and uh, traveling through the universe, and if you encounter some uh, intrahydrogens, and if the light is coming through nearby the galaxies, you will have you have this strong absorption line. And this will be the DOAs we want to find. So this will be the saturated and saturated and absorption lines with stamping winds. The problem of finding DOAs 
I think could be um, summarized into two points. Like uh, the first point would be finding the continuums, the spectrum before the absorption. You want to find that, and then you try to fit the work profiles to the absorption so to constrain the current density of the system. So before the uh, Garnet paper, people done this by hands. What do I mean by hand is that you try to you have a trained astronomer to look at the spectrums to try to guess what the continuum looks like, and then manually fit the work profiles. So this not this method will not scale out to the future survey. So in the Garnet paper, um, we propose this um, idea to use. Oh, I have the animation I forgot. We propose this idea for. Um, using basic model selection for automated process of finding DOAs. So the model will be selecting between the model with absorptions, the, with the DOAs versus the model without absorptions. And you can think about on the left-hand side, you are trying to find the probability of detecting a DOA by considering different models. So you have model with DOAs, model without DOAs, competing with two models then get a posterior. And we also considering the weaker DOAs absorbers to improve the accuracy of the, our, our detection. The, the part we do in the machine learning is the Gaussian, we learn the Gaussian process um, uh, models to represent the lactic function, which I'll talk about later. The prior will be the frequency of the DOAs as a function of the redshifts. So you can see it's roughly 10% at redshift four to six, and then lower redshift two to, two to four is like um, lower than 10%. It kind of makes sense. So the Gaussian process model will be this, um, including the mean functions, left hand side, right hand side, the covariance matrix. So uh, this will be trained on the rest brain. And what we do here is that we train a Gaussian process using data without the DOAs. So you have this nice um, crystal emission spectrum, also the emission covariance. Which in, it, one part of the covariance, including the emission covariance on the pixel levels, you can see like a cor correlated um, uh, emission pixels in this la in the large covariance matrix. One part of it, I, we embed the kind of physical model for absorptions, the noise for the lambda factories. So it, it's a registry dependent absorption noise. We train, also train from data. It's a parameterized um, um, a turn to train from data. And we have the instrumental noise. And we have another part that try to shift the, uh, the mean, mean function of the model to the mean flux of the spectrum. So this is the A term. So how it performs is that it performs the classification plus the Bayesian inference at the spectrum level. So for the DOA model, you need to marginalize over the current density and also the, the registries. We only consider these two parameters. So you can see in a posterior space, you have this um, current density and the registries of DOAs. We have two DOAs here corresponding to two um, absorptions here. So you have two peaks. So nice thing is that you can get the posterior um, by this method directly, and likely who are from the Gaussian process directly. And for multiple DOAs, what we do is doing fully Bayesian. We judge marginalizing over uh, more parameters in the, in the Bayesian model. Uh, the speed is like uh, five seconds. It's kind of surprisingly very fast because we do a quasi more quasi Monte Carlo method here instead of the CMC. And the accuracy of the class, class, uh, classifying um, DOAs uh, is roughly 96% uh, um, against the testing set for the visual inspection. So this is one part of the example. The second example is that we are asking a question about whether we can find DOAs on a spectrum without knowing the ratios of the quasar. So this is kind of more difficult question. So we have a additional Three parameters, the quasar ratios. Uh, this is kind of three parameter in the Gaussian process that you have in the mean function, also in the covariance. So we also need to extend the Gaussian process to larger range to include more emission lines to improve the registry constraints. 
So you can see this covariance spectra is 8,000 by 8,000 pixels. It's very large and it's, it's data driven from the, the data we have from um, DR12's SDSS. And how it performs is that it performs the registry inference plus the classifications plus the uh, current density inference in just one model. Um, you can imagine this is uh, the more difficult problem. So the accuracy dropped like 4% caused by some registry estimation mismatch. One of the examples is that you wrongly fit lemma of peak to another emission peak, like, like here. You have an additional um, likelihood peak here, but the, the best one will be here. Uh, the speed is like one, roughly one minute per spectrum, so it's slower. Um, but one benefit of, of this method is that you can also you see as a standalone quasar ratio estimator if you don't marginalize over the DOA parameters. Final example I will show is the we can use the same model to constrain the metal lines as a carbon four finder. So we cover with um, Katie Kusik from Hawaii. And this project is led by uh, another student in our lab, uh, Reza Monanti, and this is in prep. So the, the interest, why this is interesting because the previous largest carbon for the catalog will be the Kusik DR7 catalog. So it's kind of long time ago. So we want to update this um, catalog. The additional thing we incorporate in this model is the interloper model. So it's kind of the, we try to avoid the situation fitting the carbon fold doublet to just one uh, single absorption. So if you have alternative model for single absorptions, then you can avoid this kind of mismatch uh, situation. So how it performs. Um, so it's, Instead of uh, finding, um, instead of doing a fully Bayesian um, integration for multiple carbon folds, we do an iterative approach. What do I mean by that? We find the first carbon fold and then max out the region and find a second one. Oh, sorry. So why we do this is because the carbon fold, carbon fold is more abundant than DOAs and it's very slow if we do a fully Bayesian integration. So in, in, by doing this, we we um, minimize the time to like 30, 30 seconds per spectrum. Accuracy is roughly 86% against the QC DR7 catalog. But we need to uh, note that after some visual inspection, we find the new carbon flow actually not found by the QC. So this, this um, number actually is not, um, could be higher or could be lower, depends on the situations. So this will be all that we, I sub just summarize here that we show that it's possible to you do the Bayesian inference plot model selections at the spectrum level at a very large data set. And we use machine learning models, basic models in this framework. And we also embed the physical models to our Gaussian process kernel and learn from the data. And we also show it's possible to marginalize over redshifts Quasar ratios and DOA classification simultaneously. Then we will um, produce the, I think it's the first machine learning driven carbon phone, carbon phone catalog very soon. And thanks for um, listening to my talk. Uh, happy to take any questions. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, that, that's thanks. Uh, I'm Ming Fun first. Very nice talk. Any questions on site? Right. So I have a quick one as well. That I wonder. Uh, so why do you choose to predict using the same methodology that for DOA and like metal lines? What about between the lamina of assistance? Have you tried anything on that yet? Oh, um, that's an interesting idea. We thought about that before, but we haven't really have labor to do that. And we, yeah, we don't have an idea for how to implement that. If you have suggestions, it would be great. <laughs> yeah, we can chat more on Slack. Yeah. Yes, if yeah, I'm interested in that, yeah. No problems. Uh, if there's no other uh, questions, let's move on first. Thanks, Mingfeng, again. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, are you online, Andrew? So the yeah, next I'm one here. will be also remote. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, 
can 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 upstairs that the remote speakers show up? <laughs> Would you be able to share your screen? I, I am sharing my screen. Oh, yeah, cool. Now we can see your screen. Thank you very much. You may start. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, today I'll be telling you about some of our recent work on measuring the 8621 Angstrom DIB in the Gaia RVS spectra. And I'll mostly be describing the model that we use, uh, which allows us to obtain this very clear, clean catalog uh, by marginalizing over stellar types of, of the background stuff. Okay, so uh, Gaia has obtained the radial velocity spectra, RVS spectra, towards on the order of 5 million stars. And this is what one of those radial velocity spectra looked like. Uh, this is the full wavelength range, and it's dominated by three main features. Uh, these are the so-called calcium-2 triplet lines. Uh, and this is how Gaia is actually measuring the radial velocity of these stars. But there's a lot more information in these spectra. Uh, and in fact, we're going to focus on a window in between two of those peaks, which I'm expanding in the bottom panel. So this is the sort of spectra that you would see if there is nothing between us and the star. Uh, but we know that there are small molecules associated with gas and dust uh, that can absorb that light. And these absorption features are also known as diffuse interstellar bands, or DIBs. Uh, and the absorption feature that we're going to be focusing on and its contribution to the spectrum is shown as this red line here uh, in the bottom panel. And you can see that it's a very small amplitude, broad feature, which is appearing on, on top of a, a much larger amplitude and highly structured background. So it's, it's sort of difficult to, to model. Uh, a comment about the data, uh, the RVS spectra were first released uh, as part of DR3. Uh, and really, this should be viewed as a preliminary release. Uh, if you look at the distribution of the sources on the sky, you see uh, it's pretty uh, heterogeneous. And most of what you're seeing is the footprint of other surveys, because the, the data set released was really a validation set uh, that was cross compared to these other surveys. But we have a million spectra as part of the public data release, so we can make a, a bit of progress. One other comment about the distribution of data uh, is that if you look at a histogram as a function of stellar SNR, you see that most of it is at very low SNR, um, below a cutoff of a stellar cutoff uh, of around 70. And I'll, and I'll talk, come back to that cutoff in a second. Uh, so we really need to learn how to work with the low SNR spectra. Uh, and I can uh, expand this histogram into two dimensions. So the stellar SNR is still on the x-axis, but on the y-axis now, I'm showing you the mean flux in these continuum normalized spectrum that are being delivered. And you can see that at high stellar SNR, uh, this is essentially a constant, uh, but at low SNR, it turns over and becomes multimodal. And the only reason I show this is to say that as with all spectroscopic pipelines, you have a bit of heterogeneity in your upstream processing, and what you really need is a method that will marginalize over that, uh, which, is, which is what I'll be showing. So getting back to the data, uh, this is a spectra that's fairly high resolution, a stellar SNR of around 70. This is where most conventional DIB pipelines would succeed. Uh, and if you look at the bottom panel, you see a very large DIB signal that I'd argue is around a 10 sigma detection. Uh, the problem is that a lot of our spectra are by construction on dusty lines of sight, because that's where these DIBs uh, live. They're co-localizing with dust. Uh, and that means that you're, you're more likely to experience extinction and have fainter a uh, fainter uh, spectra. So in contrast, here is a stellar SNR of around 40 spectra. Uh, this would not be handled by most pipelines. Uh, but you can see, uh, I would argue, there's still a very clear dip signal uh, that uh, I would assign to be about an 8 sigma detection. So uh, the reason why th that most pipelines are not handling these spectra well is that they go through about the same process of trying to fit a single point estimate of the best fit stellar spectrum to the data divide by that and fit a Gaussian to the residual. And so that really requires that you have enough information uh, to estimate uh, the properties of the star well enough to divide uh, by that best fit spectrum. But if you just are interested in whether or not there is a DIB uh, present, you don't really need to know the T effective of the star, for example, right? You just need to know that there's a massive signal here. So uh, this very conventional way of finding DIBs is uh, part of uh, the way that the Gaia team put out uh, a DIB catalog as part of the uh, DR3 release. And I'm just calling out two parameters uh, from that catalog. The, the lambda div, the center wavelength of the Gaussian that's being fit to the residuals, reported in the stellar rest frame, versus the width of that Gaussian. Uh, and so what you see, this is a 2D histogram, is that even within the highest quality sample, uh, there's a clear trend as a function of the width of the Gaussian fit towards the upper left-hand corner, uh, a trend that is you know, corresponding to velocity offsets on the order of 50 to 100 kilometers per second. 
And then there's this large pileup in the top left-hand corner that extends outside the box. And you see there are several pileups of specific wavelengths in the stellar rest frame. And so I think this should really call to mind the idea that there is some impact of the stellar lines on this conventional method. And that becomes even clearer when you plot a set of stellar lines. So those that are very carefully calibrated as part of the Gaia line list are shown in green. Uh, and some that are, are less well calibrated or not present in the Gaia line list are shown in magenta. And in fact, the two largest set of pileups here um, where, where divs were uh, identified, but uh, at very specific wavelengths in the stellar rest frame happen to correspond to known iron one lines, not in the Gaia line list. Uh, in contrast, if you look at the catalog that I'll be talking about shown on the left here, we see no such pileups in the stellar rest frame. Uh, in fact, we see a distribution of lambda div that's exactly what we'd expect based on the dispersion of the ISM. So I'll spend the rest of this talk trying to tell you about the method uh, that allowed us to make what I think is clearly a, a large improvement in the div catalog. So we call that method MAGIX, which stands for Marginalized Analytic Data Space Gaussian Inference for Component Separation. And the very basic idea is that you model your spectrum as a linear combination of components X sub K, where the X sub K are drawn from a very high dimensional space. Uh, in this case, we're going to work in the data space instead of 2,000 wavelength bins in the RBS spectrum. Uh, and the, this the high dimensional uh, space that X sub K is drawn from is, is described by a prior covariance matrix C sub K. And the only other constraint on the problem is that you know that the sum of these components must exactly equal the data. Okay, and because these high dimensional spaces are hard to visualize, let me just show you the covariance matrix for one of these components. Um, this is the, the stellar component. Uh, and the way that we obtain this covariance matrix is we take just high signal to noise, low reddening spectra, and compute XX transpose. Okay, that gives us this 2000 by 2000 dimensional covariance matrix, which you can see is dominated both on the diagonal and off diagonal by the calcium two triplet. So since we're interested uh, in, in the region in between these two peaks, uh, let me extract an eigenvector and zoom in to the region around the div so we can see all the nice bumps and wiggles. Uh, some of those bumps are well explained by the nice green lines in the Gaia line list, and some of those uh, are falling on these uh, uh, magenta lines that I showed before that are also coincident with some of the pileups in the catalog. But regardless of any line assignments, uh, I just want to prove that our data-driven model isn't uh, uh, learning spurious features. All of these features really are of stellar origin, and that's clear when you overplot a, a solar spectrum on top, and you see a match to all of these features. OK, so this isn't to critique any one line list. You know, all line lists are, by definition, incomplete. Uh, the point is, is that our approach avoids committing to a single line list entirely. In fact, better than that, it avoids committing to a single best fit stellar spectrum. So instead, what we're actually obtaining are full uh, posteriors over each component. Uh, and using the equation shown on the left here, uh, you can see that that's obtained for the very low cost of a single matrix inverse, which is part of what makes this method so scalable and computationally efficient. And rather than going through those equations in detail, let me just work on a toy problem here to give you some intuition. So, uh, Instead of working in a high dimensional space, which you might have a hard time visualizing, we can look at a, a toy problem where you have two pixels and your data is the sum of two components, A and B. And so the component separation problem phrased this way is just saying, given your data and your prior C, A, and sub B, you want to find the best A and B that sum to the data. Okay, and so if your prior on A is a very tight covariance matrix along the x-axis and your prior on B is a very tight covariance matrix along the y-axis, uh, then I think we all know what the right decomposition is. It's just a Cartesian projection. Right, so you just say that your A component is your X component, and your B component is your Y component. And the only difficulty between passing uh, uh, from a just simple projection to a posterior is just accounting for the uncertainty in the prior along X and Y and transferring that uncertainty to the components. Uh, the equations on the last slide also take care of cases that are not so clear cut, uh, where the prior for A and B are not exactly orthogonal. Uh, and then you have to do a little bit of geometry to work out the right projection. Uh, but I think we, we still have a lot of intuition for what's going on here. And again, you pass the posterior. Okay, so now let me show you how we uh, model a, a real data set. So here's a, a real spectrum zoomed into the region around the div. And we can first say, we suppose that our model is that this is a linear combination of a stellar component and a residual that's consistent with noise. Uh, well, most of what you've done here is you've obtained a denoise stellar spectrum shown in the second row. Uh, and the residuals are mostly consistent with measurement noise, except for this bump here. And this is actually the contribution of the div. And what's exciting about this is it shows you that unmodeled components are just going to appear in the residuals, which is great for doing data-driven discovery. You can revisit the spectrum under a model 
uh, that uh, says that you, your, your data is a linear combination of a stellar component, a div component, and a residual. And what you see now is that the residual is flat. The div contribution has moved into its own panel here, and the stellar spectrum has changed almost not at all. So what we do to build our div catalog is we reprocess all of these spectra under both sets of models. We can uh, evaluate the delta chi squared and convert that into a measure of the div SNR. Um, and we say that we've detected a div if it's greater than a 3.8 sigma cut, which is a value we calibrated using synthetic injection tests. So I think there's a lot of validation questions that one might ask. Um, one that I'm really interested in asking is with a method that's linear like this and that's using a single covariance matrix to represent a large range of stars, um, is whether or not you can actually marginalize over a large range of stellar types this way. And so uh, here I'm just showing you all public IRBS spectra in stellar parameter space as reported by GSP spec. Uh, this in the middle panel is showing you a 2D histogram of all of the training data that we use to build the stellar covariance. And on the right, uh, I'm showing the total chi squared per degree of freedom on average as a function of location in stellar parameter space. And what you can see is that it's very close to one over a large range of this parameter space, over a large range of stellar types. And it only exceeds our cutoff, which is fairly modest of around 1.4, for the hottest and coldest stars that might not even be labeled correctly and are very clearly a small fraction of the population. Um, I also want to address the question of whether or not this actually matters for any astrophysics. You know, you're doing a lot of fancy marginalization uh, work here. But I think it is important because there have been, for example, recently some questions about whether or not divs have been detected inside of the local bubble, which is a dust-free cavity uh, around the sun. Uh, and in part, that, that work was supported uh, by the Gaia DRS3 div catalog uh, on this 8621 Angstrom div. Uh, and in contrast, we find no statistically significant detections, as indicated by the lack of red points or five sigma detections, inside uh, the local bubble, uh, which is shown in this 3D rendering here. So all of those red points fall outside the bubble. Okay, so with that, I'll just end by saying that I've shown a, a new method for doing div detection, applied it to the Gaia RVS spectra to create a new 8621 Angstrom div catalog uh, that's free of detectable stellar contamination. Uh, if you're interested, all of the catalog uh, components and code are available on our website. And I'll just end by um, acknowledging my five readers, Catherine, Josh, and Doug, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew, again. Uh, any questions on site? Great. Um, I also have a quick one as well. I'm not really working on that, but I'm wondering when you say that there are some, uh, rec there are some parts that is like a modeled component, uh, will, you, will we be able to like keep improving this whole catalog that by just adding components, figure out what is missing and then adding in? Is that the plan? Uh, yeah, one could do that. For example, um, if, if you had a diffuse interstellar band that you had not yet identified, it would appear in the residuals, and you can stack the residuals and then try to identify, you know, some low amplitude diffuse interstellar band that way. So yeah, what one, one can go through the residuals and try to improve your models of the ISM, or if they're, uh, if, instead of using a data-driven model for the stars like we do here, uh, you could use a synthetic uh, set uh, uh, of spectra to build the model and then try to find missing stellar lines. Uh, in, in your residuals. So you can do it either way. Thank you very much. Okay, if not, that's thanks, uh, Andrew, again. And we will welcome our last speaker for the morning session, Willem. PhD student coming from the Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute. I'm giving my talk today on behalf of the DESI collaboration and also the Transients and Z Cosmology Working Group. Um, I should also give a shout out to the sponsors and the participating institutions of DESI as well. Um, so I'm going to start with a relatively brief overview of what DESI is, uh, just so that everybody's kind of on the same page. Basically, DESI is a galaxy survey that's going to observe significantly more galaxies uh, than previous surveys have managed um, in, of the order 30 to 40 million uh, galaxy spectra. And it's going to do this by using 
a uh, fiber fed multi object spectrograph attached to the mile telescope up at Kitt Peak. Um, each uh, fiber of which there are 5,000 has a robotic positioner on it, allowing the fibers to be positioned exactly onto a known uh, galaxy uh, each night. And it's going to do this across 14,000 square degrees over the course of five years. This is the footprint after the first year. You can see we're already at 23%, so slightly ahead of schedule, even with a uh, fire up at Kitt Peak uh, just last year. Um, and this is for the dark survey. The bright survey is even further along, I think, of the region 30%. So DESI is going, observes a variety of objects. Um, it observes bright galaxies, uh, luminous red galaxies, emission line galaxies, and quasars, all of these at varying redshifts. As shown here, um, the Fuji data set, which is the survey validation data, and Guadalupe, which was uh, main survey. So my particular interest is transients. And whilst DESI is not a transient survey, it will detect transients by happenstance. So overlaid here is a year of TNS alerts, TNS being the transient name server, which is just the uh, basically the way that the IAU publishes uh, classifications of transients. And you can see in the DESI footprints, there's some 14,000 alerts, 1,500 of these have uh, actual classifications. Um, and this is for mostly low redshift uh, objects with a variety of uh, magnitudes. So in particular, I deal with supernovae. Um, supernovae come in a wide variety of uh, types, they all look different from each other. Um, and the kind of standard way that we classify supernova is shown uh, above me here, um, with the typical hydrogen distinction between type one and type two, and then further distinctions made based on different element lines like silicon or helium. Early classif classification methods of supernova were manual, so this is stuff like SNID or Superfit, which used cross-correlation or chi-squared minimization. But in the era of big data, nobody really wants to sit down and go through 35 million galaxy spectra. Um, so instead, we look to machine learning for this. In particular, one such recent example is known as DASH, which is a simple convolutional neural network code made using TensorFlow which uh, works similar to cross-correlation, but is machine learning. But supernova are not uh, something that we would consider complete class as being more similar to an incomplete class. So we're sure everybody would know what a dog is if presented with one. If we consider this tanuki or the noggery shown on the top here, if, is this a raccoon? Is this a dog? This is a slightly more difficult classification question. Uh, the same we can consider about the platypus, where it lays eggs, it has a bill, and yet it's a mammal, and other mammals don't uh, do these things. This is hopefully showing you that if you don't have the full range of information for your classes, you can end up making incorrect or strange uh, classifications. So the way that DESI currently classifies Supernova is using kind of called the DESI Transient Identification Pipeline, or also known as DESI TRIP. This is a pixel-based uh, deep neural network, which means that basically every pixel goes into the neural network, so each flux value is, uh, is an input. It's supervised learning insofar as that the supernova classes are given to are known um, a priori but the neural network is deciding which features of the spectra are relevant to which class. It's pretty expensive to train. Every time there's a new data release, uh, the whole thing has to be retrained. Um, and it's relatively sensitive to how your uh, spectroscopic reduction is done because it's taking each pixel in, uh, changes to how your uh, binning or any other pre-processing steps uh, will typically have a uh, potentially large effect. Uh, but it is very fast, uh, which is kind of the key thing when you're dealing with uh, a lot of spectra. Uh, and you can see from this confusion matrix, that it does a pretty good job of uh, classifying into the different supernovae. In particular, it's 100% for the 
uh, hosts and then close to 100% for uh, the other supernova types. So show here is just some example uh, spectra. I should point out that this is not real supernova spectra. This is real DESI galaxy spectra with super, supernova light superimposed on top. Um, but in black here is the spectra. In red is a best fit attempt at the galaxy. And you can see that clearly it's not a galaxy. It's got a nice absorption line here. This is probably silicon two. And again, down here, we can see again, this is another supernova. Uh, and you can see this the galaxy uh, line not really being a good fit at all to that. As far as statistics go, um, they vis we visually inspected uh, 26 type 1As that had TNS counterparts and 47 without. We see that they have uh, a range of colors, um, a range of brightnesses, in particular, though, uh, it seems that the uh, DESI supernova are go out. There are fainter DESI supernova uh, than in the TNS alerts, and also go out to uh, slightly higher redshifts. And this is all in line with uh, the predictions for survey uh, that's gone off the screen. So that's not a very helpful sentence. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it said statistics in line with resurvey predictions. Um, but uh, DESI doesn't, isn't just going to detect supernovae. It's also capable of doing different transients, particularly peculiar types. So for example, shown at the top, oh, shown at the top here is a peculiar type 1A, which is just a subtype of the overall type 1A class. And shown down here is a cataclysmic variable star. So it's just showing that Desi trip is capable of uh, identifying more than just a regular supernova. It can identify the weird and kind of other types of uh, transient objects that might be detected. My specific work is on something called STAG, which is a new way of tagging and su classifying supernova. So what we do is we use logistic regression, which is just this curve shown here. Um, which rapidly transitions between zero and one. And we use this in order to tag spectra based on features that are present. So you can imagine that the type 1A supernova would have a tag for a silicon line, would have a tag for a sulfur line, and would have would have a tag for a hydrogen, except that tag would be close to or equal to zero because type 1A shouldn't have any hydrogen present in them. And these tags look somewhat like this. So this is the silicon 2 tag. Then this here is a pretty clear absorption line feature. And this is kind of how each of the tags will look like, each of them basically being a representation of, uh, the, of the feature that you're looking for. So what STAG actually does is binary relevance multi-label classification, which is just a really long-winded way of saying that the probability of one tag does not depend on the probability of another tag. So the fact that it's got a high probability for silicon does not therefore impact the probability for any of the other given tags. To get to these final, that's a very small beta, uh, to get to the final beta values, we minimize the loss function, get this as quite close to zero as possible. And once we have all of these tag values, these then get fed into a very simple um, neural network, just an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. The output layer using softmax, and we're using ReLU for the activation function. And once that goes through, it then goes into one of the classes. Um, so this is how STAG performed. Shown on the left here is a confusion matrix for template spectra. Uh, again, this is doing a pretty good job of classifying into slightly fewer classes than DesiChip was doing, but we still show uh, above 95% for all of the different classes. This is for template spectra. Template spectra is 
kind of perfect in a sense and very different to real data. So we wanted to test it out on real data as well. So we tested it on OSDES, which is the Australian Dark Energy Survey. Um, we tested it out on 59 spectra that had been classified by DASH, this previous other machine learning code, as well as ATELs, which are astronomical telegrams, which were classifications made using superfit or SNID, so manual classifications. Uh, we find that we agree with the uh, manual classifications 86% of the time, and with the other machine learning code 83% of the time. Um, we note that some of the other machine classification, machine learning classifications uh, tended to be 1C broad, which was basically uh, that uh, dash saying that it didn't really know what, what to do with it. Um, and so we're reasonably confident that STAG is actually making correct classifications. And certainly if you look at the tags, uh, you can see that uh, those difference in, in classifications make sense, not necessarily saying that STAG is correct in those cases where they disagree, but it's understandable why STAG made a different classification. It's not all sunshine and roses. Um, in particular, we're very redshift sensitive, Desi trip and STAG. And if we get the wrong redshift, then we end up making an incorrect classification. So these are just two cases where it's failed. So this should clearly be a supernova. This again is probably the uh, silicon two um, absorption line, but it's fitted it to a QSO. Um, and the same down here, this is a type 1A 91T and it's fitted it to a galaxy again, because it's got the wrong redshift. Um, so you kind of desperately need good redshifts in order to do these classifications. So that brings me to the end. So basically DESI is going to massively increase the number of galaxies we have spectra for, and therefore is going to increase the number of supernovae we have spectra for. And so we want some good ways of classifying, and it's important to kind of make sure that the current way that we're doing classification is kind of up to standard. DESI trip is pixel-based uh, neural network. STAG is a feature-based neural network um, and has kind of these value-added uh, extra information from the tags, but both uh, are kind of dependent on having accurate redshifts. Thank you very much. And any questions? Very good. Uh, any questions on site? Thank you for the talk. This is very interesting. Uh, just a comment. Uh, I work with supernova, but uh, light curves, and we always come to the for us like spectra is a hundred percent sure every time. So what you're telling me is that you also have a whole bunch of process to make sure how confident you are. And okay, uh, this is scary for me. Uh, but the other thing, my my real question is. Um, how much does your results depend on the epoch of the supernova that you took the spectra? Or do you have like many spectra for, for the same object? Um, so for, for DESI trip, um, DESI trip has a lot of uh, samples for different types of supernova at different epochs. Um, and the same for when we were doing STAG on the template spectra, there was uh, variety of epochs. I would say that the problem, especially with STAG at the moment, is that it doesn't have any age information. Um, and so whilst you could see that something had changed, if you looked at the values of the tags, you could see that a line had weakened or had strengthened. Um, that is a drawback at the moment that we don't have uh, age information. Let's thank uh, William again. Does that conclude the morning session? Yeah, thank you. So thanks everyone for joining the morning session and the afternoon session will resume at 1.30. And now you're free to grab your lunch and feel free to bring it back to eat here and chat with everyone else. And thanks people online as well. Knock, knock. Yeah.
Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Matt Grading. I'm a postdoc at the University of Cambridge, though I did most of this work while I was at Southampton. So today I'll talk about my work looking at augmenting supernova training sets using generative adversarial networks. So, I mean, I'm gonna, this is a kind of schematic of the network architecture, but I've only got three minutes, so I'm not gonna get into exactly how they work. Um, but the key thing is, why do we want to use a generative type of model for this? Because, I mean, the main limitation, as I'm sure we've all experienced when you try to apply machine learning to astronomy, is the training data, generally sp scarcity of it. Now, certainly in supernovae, what we often do to get around that is to use simulated data sets. But the issue with relying on simulations is that if you don't have a full physical understanding of what you're trying to simulate, your simulations are never going to be perfectly representative of either the observed or the true populations. Um, certainly, the, what I was focusing on with this was core collapse supernovae, and there's an awful lot we don't know about them, and we can't create fully representative simulations. So the idea here is that if we can use some kind of generative data-driven approach, we can take a kind of, an, we can not rely on any physical model, train something which can learn from the full variability of your training set, a sample from that distribution, and then from that generate a much larger training set, which you can then use to train your classifier on. Now, this is a type of approach that has been successfully applied outside of astronomy in order to improve the performance of classifiers. So I'll move on here to some kind of example generated light curves. But essentially, why the way this has been designed is that I've used a GAN, but while they typically use convolutional neural networks, I use recurrent neural networks. And the advantage of that is for supernovae, it's very important that we can generate variable length time sequences because we don't always have the same number of observations for each object. That's something that can vary. So by using this, we're able to generate kind of multi-band photometry with non-simultaneous observations with uh, for variable length time sequences. So this was just an example model trained on type two supernova light curves, getting some of the kind of characteristic shapes there. So these things all look kind of supernova -y, but that doesn't really mean anything in isolation. So this next plot, I was just showing, so it's a comparison between the training set that was used to train this model and then the generated set. So what I've taken is just kind of a quick mean and standard deviation across the full light curve population. Um, when you look at that, we can see that in general, this approach is learning to produce a, a realistic light curve and also encompassing the, you know, pretty well the full variability that we're seeing in that training set. Now, what this is telling us is that this approach, okay, can be used to generate physically realistic light curves and therefore can be used in this approach. So this is basically where the work's got to at this stage. Next step is then to actually use one of these generated data sets to train a classifier and compare performance to what's been done before. So I will leave you with my conclusions and thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, any, any questions for this short talk? Very quickly, uh, how computationally expensive is to to generate this? So the training step is very much computationally intensive. Uh, once it's trained, then you can generate thousands and tens of thousands of objects in seconds. So okay. sampling distribution is very, very fast. It's just that, yeah, the training is always the limiting factor there. But once you've got a trained model, then you're done. So that's the... I also have a question that, uh, do you have a limitation about how long this supernova you can... So because you only maybe like the time frames is within a certain period of time, is there a limitation on the how quick this supernovae happens? You can make that generation. Oh, you mean how, the, uh, how long or short it can be? Yes. Sequence. Yeah. So I mean, it will, I mean, I've designed it especially so it will it will basically learn. I mean, in theory, the model can generate an infinitely long time series. It's just that the longer it gets, the fewer examples of things it's seen at that state before. So if you generate a time sequence of kind of a thousand steps towards the end, it will just lose all meaning, just generate nonsense. But in the kind of typical reference for when the, for the training, the kind of the lengths that you have on your training data set, then it should perform fairly well. So it will basically should be able to match whatever you've trained it on. Thank you very much. Okay, that's thanks. Uh, Matthew again. And the next one is also a short talk, will be Robbie. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm here from the University of Bristol to talk about uh, an application of uh, machine learning, so trying to detect quasi-periodic eruptions in X-ray light curves. 
Um, so the problem is that essentially QPs are a very, very, very exotic type of variability. So far only been seen in five active galaxies. And uh, it shows fairly uh, predictable periods of variability. So on the left there is just a standard AGN like uh, damped random warp kind of variability. On the right is an example showing some QPs. So you have these very strong peaks. Uh, it's very high amplitude, short period variability compared to what you'd normally see. So the real problem is, how do we then go about finding more QPE sources? So we went with, uh, try and train a neural network, uh, pick out some time domain variability features from the light curves, and then compare it with uh, some real observations. So we simulated the training data set based on the QPs that we'd seen, picked out the features, trained it, and then applied it to a catalog. Um, we went with a neural network just because actually we weren't trying to reinvent the wheel. We wanted to see whether some fairly standard, well-known, uh, widely used techniques could be used in this kind of uh, field. Um, in terms of the results, uh, I think we've got a fairly strong proof of concept. Uh, on our simulated light curves, we were predicting the classification with an accuracy of about 95%. Uh, when we then applied it to uh, real data, this was uh, with a total of 14 time domain features. So uh, taking an entire light curve, which could be thousands of data points down to just 14 dimensions, um, it did drop slightly. So we got accuracies of around 85 to 95 percent and F1 scores that were significantly lower because it's a very unbalanced training, uh, sorry, a very unbalanced testing set. We actually found that when we started to reduce the number of features involved from the full 14, we got significantly higher accuracies. Um, so we could get accuracies of over 98%. Then applied all of this to a large catalog, the XMM Serendipitous Source Catalog. Uh, it's got about 900,000 objects in it, of which there were about 90,000 which had suitable light curve information. We made some interesting finds, but no QPEs yet. Um, so on the left-hand side is a, well, I think it's a high proper motion star. And on the right-hand side was just an unclassified X-ray source, but not of the type that we were looking for. What we did find though, uh, so these four light curves may look very, very similar to you, but they are in fact all four different light curves from different objects on different parts of detectors on the same uh, observation possibly suggesting that actually in the source catalog, background subtraction hasn't been uh, happening properly over large numbers of uh, objects. I'm gonna leave those conclusions up there. Um, I'm hopeful that this is gonna get published in RASI very, very soon. Um, so please keep an eye out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions on the room? I have a quick one, actually. Uh, wait, what did I think about? <laughs> can you go back to your slide? Oh my God, your slide just gone. I can. Yeah. All right. I was wondering, that would you be able to tune the number of fixtures that is used? Because it seems like it does matter a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, so with a neural network, obviously it's not quite so easy. So actually, when we were looking at the numbers of features, we ran every single possible combination of features uh, that we could go through, uh, starting from uh, one feature or 13 features and sort of me going from the outer edges to say, actually, if we take them out or add them in, does it make it better or worse? Um, and uh, we did find that there were a few that looked slightly better than others, but overall, I think it was two that were particularly poor and one that was particularly useful. Um, so, it really was a balance. There were lots and lots that were lots of combinations of features that worked equally well, though. Well, then, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, that's thanks, uh, Robbie again. So our next speaker will be fifteen minutes talk. Uh, be Daniel. Thank you. Uh, well, I guess the next slide. But I cannot not move.
Excuse me, slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Mata Sanchez, and I'm coming from the Canary Island Astrophysics Institute. I actually work at the Compact Object Group there. And today, I will show you a pilot study that we have been developing during this past year, where we are trying to automatically detect offflow features in the optical and near infrared spectra of these type of systems. But before getting into that, I will give you just a quick overview of the field and why we are interested in searching for those. So for those of you who are not familiar with X-ray binaries, uh, well, this is uh, an image of what an X-ray binary might look like. Of course, it's just an artistic uh, depiction of the system. Uh, but they are basically systems made of a regular star. So in the case of low mass X-ray binaries, it's a solar-like or even less massive star and a compact object, which can be either a neutron star or a black hole, which is orbiting close enough to the companion star to strip some mass out of it, just due to Roche law of overflow. Uh, the strip mass is not falling into the black hole directly, but because of angular momentum conservation, it forms an accretion disk. And it's actually this accretion disk, which gets really, really hot, what allowed them uh, to be detected originally in the X-rays. So uh, I will be focusing only in the low mass X-ray binaries, and in particular, uh, in those of the transient class. Uh, so the transient uh, systems are those that spend most part of their lives in a quiescent low luminosity state, but uh, every now and then uh, go into really bright epochs where they can increase their magnitude across the whole spectrum in five or even seven magnitudes. And uh, during these epochs of, uh, that we know, know as upwards, uh, the typical SED uh, that you will find will be the blue one. So uh, there are different components from the binary contributing to different ranges in the in frequency or the wavelength sp space, but I will be only focusing on the optical range, which is around here. And in that range, what you will be seeing is mainly the accretion disk itself, actually the other range of the accretion disk. Okay, so <clears throat> how, does the, how does the optical spectra of the system during outbursts look like? Well, if you took in spectra, you would probably see a blue continuum because the accretion disk is actually quite hot. It's speaking in the uh, farther away than the, the ultraviolet, even in the soft red X-rays. Uh, but in the optical, on top of that blue continuum, you will find some emission lines uh, that will be mainly hydrogen and helium because uh, they are coming from the accretion disk and the accretion disk is made of the same material that the companion star was made of. And uh, instead of being single peak emission lines, uh, you will typically see them as double peak. And this profile is actually just due uh, to the fact that this is uh, generated by material in the disk. And the material in the disk uh, has a Keplerian distribution of velocities. And if you are looking at it at a particular orbital inclination, it will naturally give rise to this double peak profile. So depending on the inclination, you may find a double peak or a single peak profile if they are just too close to each other. But this is what we will be expecting to see. So uh, that was pretty much the general picture of what we see when we look at the spectra of one of the systems. So this is just two spectra of the same system at different epochs. And uh, in 2015, uh, we noticed that there, was, there were some extra features on top of this typical double, double peak profile. Uh, in particular, uh, blue city uh, absorptions and uh, some, also some broad emission, uh, broad wings on top of the profile. And actually those type of pictures have been previously recorded in a lot of different objects, like in massive stars, in supernovae, in cataclysmic variables, and they have always associated with offloads. So actually uh, that uh, meant that for the first time we were able to detect offloads in the optical range for these systems. And since that point onwards, every time a new outburst of one of these systems occurred, we look at it and try to find uh, those particular features. And actually I can tell you that in pretty much 90% of the system that have, we have looked at since then, we have found them. So it's actually a feature that is, it was always there, but it was not previously detected because they may be uh, sometimes a bit shallow. So you need a large signal to noise. And also because they are uh, quite short lived. So they can be there for only 20 minutes or even less, and then they disappear. Uh, the reason for that is because the system is really variable in luminosity during the outburst, and at some point you will have your offload completely ionized, so then you will not see any absorption or emission features, and you will have to wait until it's at the adequate temperature in order to see them. 
So uh, at this point, uh, well, or during the development of this uh, new line of research, we uh, well first uh, defined uh, this diagnostic diagram in order to help us to detect these offset features. And actually, this diagram is based on a really simple approach. So you have your emission line, in this case, the H alpha line. You have, in this case, this blue shift data source, which is associated with this offload. This is what you want to detect. Uh, so what you will do is to fit with a single Gaussian, the emission line. And because this line can sometimes be either single peak or double peak, you will mask the center of the line. So you will be only looking at the wings and uh, subtracting that Gaussian from the actual profile in order to get this residual, which is uh, pretty much telling you if it is a negative uh, residual on the blue, uh, that means that you have a blue citrus absorption. If it is positive in the red, that means that you have an excess in emission there. And by doing that, for each one of these spectra, you can put them in this diagram. So the bottom uh, right part, that's the P Sydney region because it has a negative uh, blue excess and a positive uh, red excess. On top of that is this nebular region where you have both red and blue excesses. And the other two regions in principle, uh, they should be forbidden regions or at least not related with this type of offloads. Uh, so uh, at the beginning we were okay, at least content with this diagram. But uh, as we started to find these features in more and more systems, uh, we started to be really aware of the limitation of this method. So for example, this method is completely neglecting uh, the actual uh, core of the line because you have to mask it, uh, which means that you can only detect offloads which are uh, in the wind, so at really high velocities. So this is about 2000 kilometers per second or so. And also uh, because you need to place that mask in order to get rid of certain asymmetries or, or, or to get rid of the double peak, uh, the selection of that mask was uh, quite observant dependent. So for every system, it has to be different. So that's something that you don't really like. You want it to be as objective as possible. So that's why uh, we have decided to move in uh, to use machine learning in order to get a more, a better uh, classifier uh, to detect these offloads. So finally, I'm moving into the machine learning part uh, because we only have a few thousand of spectra in total for all of the systems that have been observed in these past 50 years. Uh, we decided to create a simulated database uh, where I basically define five different classes. So I'm just trying to model one single line uh, profile and uh, the five different classes will be, the first one is just the double peak emission line profile. So the typical theoretical spectra that you would, that you would expect. And then the other four are the same base profile, but on, pop, on top of that, we added the off block like feature. So for example, this class will be the blue sheeted absorption uh, feature. This one is adding this broad emission line of, on top of the double peak. The next one is actually a combination of the previous two because the actual shape of a, pro, of a passing the profile will be a blue sheeted absorption and a, a bit of an excess uh, in the red. And uh, this final class uh, is actually not necessarily an offload uh, because it's uh, the double peak plus a broad uh, absorption. But this is something that we have found in some of our spectra and we wanted the machine learning to be informed about that in order to not misclassify it as an offload. So I pretty much created a stimulated databases for four different lines. And I create these four databases differently because each line uh, may have contaminants close to it. So for example, this example, I think it was the H beta line. So there is a bump here. So that corresponds, I think it was a helium one line, which is next to it, uh, but it's not always there in all of the system and all of the time. Uh, so that's why I decided to create in the simulated database this extra feature to be able to come for that. And I did the same thing for four different lines, which are the four classical lines that we find in low mass sensor binaries and uh, analyze them separately for now. Okay, so uh, once I have the simulated database, I tried three simple architectures in order to be able to classify into the different classes. This is a supervised uh, algorithm, of course. Uh, I tried uh, basically a multi-layer perceptron, a fully convolutional neural network because we are only looking at the profile of that single line. So we are not worried about uh, correlation with uh, data which were too far away. And uh, the residual network classifier, which is a bit uh, is similar to the convolutional neural network, but there's a step with feedback and so on. I will not get into the details. 
uh, but uh, the best results of, of these three architectures uh, were found for the residual uh, network, actually. And this is an example of the confusion matrix that we are getting for, I think it was the H-alpha line, uh, where you can see that most of the classes has uh, acute accuracy and recall, except for this one, which is only about uh, 90%. But actually, this class is the combined class that, if you remember from my previous slide, is actually a combination of the wing and the blue assortion class, so both feature uh, put together. And if you look at where the misclassified spectra are leaking, they actually leak into these two other classes. So that means that probably uh, in some of these combined classes, one of the two features were just too shallow, and then when the classifier tried to classify it, it only picked the strongest one. But it's not an issue for us because our main target was to be able to detect offloads or, or the no blessing of offloads. Okay, so uh, once that we have the, the train classifier with the simulated database, we decided to apply it to uh, two data sets of two outboards of two low mass x binaries. So this is an example of just a few of the spectra to which we apply the classifier to. This is a B4 port signal, so it's a black hole that went into outboards in 2015 last time. And uh, it actually was really bright, so we managed to get a lot of spectra uh, during the outburst. And one thing that we noticed is that the offload features appear and disappear quite rapidly. So we decided to do the classification one by one for each one of them. These are the four lines that I was mentioning before. Uh, so this, uh, which are typical lines that you find in Lomas binaries. binary. So the H alpha line, this helium one, five, uh, eight, 76, the H beta, and this helium two line. So uh, just as a, a remark, I will tell you that uh, in the same way that for the H beta line, we had to include this contaminant, this, uh, thank you, this helium one line, uh, for the helium one, five, uh, eight, 76, we had to include the salient doublet, which is pretty much on top of our line. So if we don't account for that, we were really worried that the actual classifier was finding some kind of weird offloads, like residue offloads or something like that. So that's why we decided to also model it. And uh, this is just a distribution of the different classes that is finding for this particular set. So for example, the H alpha line uh, in this particular data set is mainly classified as either broad wings or combined type. Uh, and by looking at the spectra, it looks kind of correct because they are really broad in the base. And some of them are asymmetrical, which can be caused by a bit of an absorption from a two city uh, then uh, the helium one line was mainly dominated by p thickness. So you can see that actually those uh, which are classified as having a p they do have it. And those who don't, they don't have anything there. So it seems that it's working quite nice. The only, sorry, the only line we're actually not that convinced about the results is the helium two line. And the reason for that is that just by looking at that profile, you can notice that is a bit different from the others. So you have the helium two emission line, which is in the middle. That's okay, it's an emission single peak. But then there is this very big contaminant next to it, uh, which uh, is known as the Bowen blend. And it's actually a blend of nitrogen, oxygen, uh, two and three lines. Uh, that is not easy to model. So during the simulation of the data sets, I was trying to model it like a, with a single broad Gaussian, but obviously that's not a good enough model. So I would not be trusting these results for that particular line. But for the other three, I would say that they were looking quite nice. So just to conclude, if I can move to the next. No, I cannot. <laughs> can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So uh, this is just the final classification on the two data sets uh, that we were analyzing. So one is B404 Signy, the other one is Maxi 1820. Uh, for B404 Signy, for the whole of the others, we find that in the H-alpha line, we pretty much always have some kind of offload, which is mainly broad winds or the combined type. For the helium one line, uh, we find that uh, about a third of the spectra uh, don't contain any offload. So that's also reassuring because we were also worried that, sorry, that if the classifier was always detecting offloads, that means that uh, the base model for the theoretical spectra was, was not good enough. Uh, something similar occurs for the HCB line. And if uh, you move to the other object, you can see that even for this H alpha line, in this case, there are 75% uh, of the spectra are regular 
theoretical spectra, and only 25% contain some type of hoplos. So that was also reassuring. And uh, well, uh, we compared the results, of course, with the traditional methods, and we found that uh, they are overall quite consistent, but uh, we are wrapping up now the paper. And um, well, future work will include having a more physical model of the offloads uh, and training a classifier to account for the different setup of the instruments and so on. But I will leave you with that. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for listening. One quick question. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, so I was, I was curious, I saw in, in some of your earlier slides that the um, like depth of some of the PCD profiles changed over the course of a system over, over a few days kind of thing. Is that kind of evolution of uh, the profiles of an individual individual line or species, is that something you take into account in, uh, in your training? Okay, so as we are uh, analyzing the spectra separately, we are not uh, considering the spectral evolution, but actually, it's good that you notice that because this uh, data set, these are just like four different spectra of that data set, but that particular one was uh, made of 85 different spectra. And you can see that the feature appears and disappears. So it pretty much evolves from being deeper to disappear completely. The reason for that is that the offload that you uh, have in the question disk, it may be always there, but because the central engine is varying in luminosity by a lot, it can ionize completely the wind and then you will, you will not see it or will see it as a different type of feature. So yeah, for now we are considering they are independent of spectra. We are not trying to trace for the evolution. It was only like this pilot study to be, uh, to at least prove that we can actually detect them in a more robust way than with the traditional method. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, thanks for the talk. Just curious uh, whether you noticed that the ResNet model would behave better than the CNN for the particular class of objects is probably due to the extension over the pixel of the signal, or generally it behaves better. Yeah, so out of the three architectures uh, we checked, uh, the, worst, the worst performing one was the multilayer precision, but I think it was not a surprise because I think this model does not take into account the sequentiality of the data. Uh, and the other two were actually quite similar. So uh, the ResNet was just better by just as much. So uh, I, I didn't look uh, more into detail into that because they were all, both of them performing quite well, but the ResNet one was consistently slightly better. And I think it was doing a better job uh, on this particular class just to be able to actually classify it as the combined type. But it was not like something massive. So if this one has an F1 of about 0.95, the uh, CNN, uh, the other one will be like 0 0.93, 94. So it was quite close together. Yeah, that's thanks. Uh, oh. <laughs> thanks again. Thank you. So we will have a two short talk online. Uh, John, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you as well. And um, please share your okay. screen. And okay. Can you see my screen? Not yet. It's a while. I think they are sorting. We can see uh, online. Yeah, now. Yeah. now we can see it. Just carry on. Okay, can you see? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, feel free to start. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I am John Suarez, a PhD candidate from the University of Los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. So today I will to introduce this project, Assessing the CS Spectra with Unsupervised Machine Learning. So the motivation behind this project is to identify detection or to detect instrumental errors in the DESI experiment. So we propose a tool based on unsupervised machine learning to identify these instrumental errors. So the results of this project is to add this method to the reduction pipeline of the DESI experiment to assess the quality of the data and also that could be included in future spectroscopy surveys. So this is the process to uh, acquire an spectrum in DESI First, make the observation, then make some corrections and calibrations using an spectroscopic reduction pipeline. 
And finally, we get the calibrated spectrum. This spectrum has a size of 2, around 2,000 points in each spectral band and around 7,000 uh, points in the concatenated spectra. So during this process, some instrumental errors or reduction errors could be appeared that could be identified like outliers. So our outlier detection-based method uh, follow the next steps. First, we project the high dimensional data that include multiple observations by, by night into a two-dimensional space using a dimensional reduction algorithm. Then we use this projection, uh, this two-dimensional space to find the outliers using a group finder algorithm. Finally, we inspect visually the features that define these outliers. So we use the UMAT algorithm, the Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection Algorithm, that is an unsupervised machine learning algorithm that works with a non-Lirmian dimensionality reduction that is used for visualization and outlier detection. In, in this image, um, we, uh, we have a set of uh, images of hand-graded numbers with 64 dimension that is projected using the UMAT algorithm in a two-dimensional space where uh, similar numbers are located in closer regions. So also in this projection, we can identify some outliers like the example that are numbers one that are at normal number one. So also we can use this um, UMAP algorithm to project the observations, the spectra from one observation night in a two-dimensional space to make this two-dimensional projection. Then using the front of friends algorithm, that is our group finder uh, groups, uh, group finder algorithm, sorry, we can uh, identify some abnormal objects or, or some islands like this one, this example, where we <coughs> inspect the spectrum from the objects that belong to this island, we can identify some uh, large negative flux, some spectra with large negative flux. We report this to the collaboration and we can identify that did uh, feature correspond to a defect in the CCD. Also, we in the collaboration identified this spectrum uh, with this particular shape. Also, with our method, we can identify these um, errors in the reduced space, in the two-dimensional space using UMAT or friend of friends. And this, this error or this instrumental error corresponds to contamination. Finally, we evaluate our method in terms of the use of memory and the time required to identify these outliers. And the memory used by, uh, by one observation night and the time is cheap and faster. So finally, uh, we can conclude that our method uh, works to identify instrumental errors in DESI. Also, this method is cheap and fast and could be included in future spectroscopic surveys. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Okay, I cannot John, hear you. John, did you hear us? Yes. Uh, <laughs> did you hear the question? Did no. <laughs> yeah, do you mind just ask on the Slack channel afterwards? Yeah. Sorry, just uh, okay. someone was asking questions, but it seems like we were muted. Yeah. But we have to move on. Sorry about that. Then they will ask questions on the Slack channel. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to the next speaker, Guillaume. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can as well. 
Yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Guillaume Guillon, postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg. And I'm going to briefly talk to you about um, how can we uh, parameterize stellar spectra with convolutional neural networks. So I put here three uh, relevant publications, and I'm going to go mainly into um, uh, the last one and show also some results from a new thing in preparation. OK, so the first thing I want to talk about is basically uh, use machine learning to prepare the spectral analysis of the foremost uh, survey that's going to be on Sky uh, next uh, year. And um, for that, we developed the convolutional neural network approach to determine lithium uh, using Gaia ISO survey spectra, which are very similar to foremost in terms of uh, spectral resolution and wavelength coverage. And this is the lithium abundance as a function of log G, where you see basically uh, the uh, main uh, sequence, uh, the giants. And I would like to uh, show, uh, pay attention to these objects here, which are a rare object lithium rich giants. So this is a plot for the training sample composed of 7,000 stars. Uh, we only use uh, real observations. We don't use um, synthetic uh, templates. And this is the uh, result of the training. Uh, showing that uh, the neural network is able to recover this uh, lithium-rich giants because according to stellar evolution, uh, giants do not have a lot of lithium because it's highly depleted. You, really, you have only very rare objects and they are peculiar objects. And machine learning are also efficient in recovering the parameters of uh, rare objects. And we don't like to use CNN as black box. So we try to go into the details of the different layers. And I show here how um, the gradients are behaving. So basically, uh, where in the spectrum uh, the information is learned from the CNN. And you see, for example, for lithium, that uh, it's only learned around the lithium line, meaning that we actually determine chemical abundances. And we don't just simply infer based on uh, stellar uh, correlations, which is great. So uh, this uh, study, if you want to uh, use the data and the code, it's available on the GitHub of the master student who did the, the, the study, Samir Nepal. We worked together when I was still in uh, Potsdam. And uh, CNN is currently tested for the Formos Galactic Pipeline. Uh, I'm going to go briefly to uh, work in preparation. And the goal here is to use CNN and try to extract uh, more reliable parameters uh, from the Gaia RVS uh, data, which is centered around the calcium triplet. Uh, we use a training set of 40,000 stars with Apogee DR17 labels. And this is basically a um, very preliminary plot where I show a kill diagram and a chemical abundance plot for 300,000 stars from the Gaia uh, RVS. So we use the RVS spectra. And because um, uh, CNNs are very versatile, I also included uh, parallaxes, uh, G, BP, RP magnitude, and also the XP spectra. That's how you are uh, able to break the degeneracies that, that are inherent to the Gaia RVS wavelength and isolate pretty well all your uh, different components in this skill diagram. And to show you one last plot before I finish is to show you why um, how uh, precise are the, uh, for example, metallicities and iron content we recover. This is for a set of 22,000 stars with a low signal to noise ratio uh, that are not seen by the CNN and are actually um, kind of the validation set. We uh, recover uh, precision below 0.1 dex uh, between what Apogee uh, gives and what CNN gives. So this is very precise, and this is a kind of uh, an impressive uh, result considering the resolution of the Gaia RVS, which is around 10,000. And um, we are really looking forward for the next uh, Gaia DR4 and DR5 release that's going to provide several millions of Gaia RVS. So with these metallicities and chemical abundances, we will enter in a new area for uh, galactic archaeology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any quick question? If not, uh, if you have any question, can please just ask on the Slack channel. And if not, that's thank the speakers again. Thank you. Yes, Inertial, are you there? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And could Excellent. you share Thank your you screen, share. please? Yep. Ah, there you go. Okay, so can you see my screen? 
Yes, we can see your screen. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so um, so thanks for, for the opportunity of giving a talk here. I, I just, in, in this very brief flash talk, I wanted to draw your attention to an important concept that applies not only to machine learning methods, but anywhere else, when you're trying to extract information from galaxy spectra. Uh, so the main idea is that when we're trying to understand uh, the stellar populations in a, in a galaxy, you know that we take the spectra and then we try to extract all sorts of, of, uh, of, uh, of observables, such as the star formation history, the chemical enrichment history. And then the traditional way of solving for this is comparing model fitting using stellar population synthesis models. You can also go towards a, a multivariate analysis, blind source separation, or uh, as uh, this is the focus of this, of this meeting, machine learning. All these methods, no matter what, ultimately depend on, on the information content of the spectra. And the way to tackle this would be via the definition of, of entropy. So in order to get entropy, we can consider an alternative way of describing a spectrum. So a spectrum can be traditionally considered as a wavelength dependent function. Basically, that gives you the flux, the amount of energy per unit time uh, as a given, uh, at a given wavelength. You can also consider the spectrum as an abstract point in a highly dimensional multi-dimensional space. So this is the analysis of multivariate analysis, PCA, ICA, factor analysis, et cetera. But the approach that concerns us would be, think of the spectrum as a, a, as a photon counting experiment. Basically, you're trying, you're measuring one photon at a time, and then you're determining the probability that that photon has a given wavelength. So in that case, we can go from a, basically a flux to a probability distribution, and automatically this allows us to define, sorry, uh, to define uh, an entropy. This entropy is defined for the whole spectrum, but uh, the way we do it is we actually break this in smaller pieces so we can come up with a so-called entropy spectrum. Uh, this talk, of course, is very brief. I cannot give uh, enough details, but you can have a look at this paper recently published in Rusty, where you can see all the, all the details there. Um, just a comparison uh, between models, as you can see here on the left, and real data from Sloan. So first of all, it doesn't come as a surprise that there is very good, uh, they, they match quite well as expected because these are coming from stellar atmospheres and we know galaxies are made up of stars. So the spectrum is actually coming from stars. You also have the diffuse emission from the gas in blue. But then the interesting bit that basically the, the important aspect that uh, stands out here is that most of the entropy, most of the information in your spectra comes in relatively small narrow windows where you have most of the variation. So this is an important thing. If you just, going back one slide, if you go to those uh, different intervals and you try to basically say, these are going to be the pieces of information that I have in my spectrum, and you do a, a further dimensionality reduction using PCA, you find that when you're using entropy, only two components will actually explain 95% of the variance. So if you want of the full information, if you follow more traditional approaches in the same spectral windows, you actually need a, a higher number of, of, such, uh, of such elements. And it doesn't come as a surprise that the most important factors that drive this would be the strength of the 4,000 angstrom region or Balmer absorption, such as H delta. Uh, but uh, the bottom line, as I said, this is way too, too short. I cannot really uh, give too, too many details here. But one question that you may have is, let's go back here. You have those uh, windows, one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's forget about H-alpha because it's contaminated by emission from the gas. If you consider those six regions, uh, how much free information, independent information, is there from region to region? So one way of tackling this would be to consider the, um, uh, the covariance matrix. So you can see up here the covariance matrix measured for the models. So these are Bruchel and Charlot models. If you take any other sets of models, you will get similar results. And these are real data. The thing that stands out, first of all, which is tremendously important, is the enormous level of covariance that you see among these intervals. Even though you, in principle, have six different indicators, you may feel happy that you have so many independent indicators, but they are not independent anymore. There's an enormous level of covariance. And this also appears in the spectra, but much less. So we can also say that models, in a way, are simpler because, after all, they are made up of a reduced number of stars, usually of order 1,000, whereas galaxies are much more complicated things. So with that in mind, I will just finish with this take-home message that entropy is going to be affecting all the methods. So even your machine learning methods, you have to be very careful. And we see that actually only very small regions are there where you have substantial amount of entropy, and there is a large intrinsic covariance. There is uh, lots of entanglement. 
So a ways of proceeding would be either we can use entropy to weigh standard methods, or my question here would be, can machine learning do better? The results we have been getting so far in the literature are okay, are encouraging, but they are not so spectacular. So, uh, so we're looking forward to, to more advances there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions here? If not, let's thank the speakers again and also feel free to talk on Slack. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So unfortunately, because we have two speakers who are ill, so we can't uh so we will finish the meeting earlier today. And then thank you everybody to come to this uh, session in this really bad weather. And I hope you have a safe journey back to where you're from. Yeah, and thank you very much. That concludes the session. Thank you.